Connecting Marylanders to their government. This is State Circle. Good evening and welcome to State Circle. I'm Jeff Salkin. It is not quite election day, but early voting has begun in Maryland. Each of the state's counties has at least one early voting location and they are open through next Thursday. The regular primary election day is June the 24th. In tonight's program, we will continue our conversations with the candidates for governor. Joining us now is Delegate Heather Mazier, Democratic candidate. Thank you for being here. Always a pleasure, Jeff. Thank you. You have gotten uh, uniformly good reviews for your debate performances and your poll numbers we've seen this week have been coming up but they're still in third place. So what do you need to have happen over the next 10 days? We see the perfect storm coming together in this race. It's all about momentum and turnout during this election and between the performance and the debates, finally getting our ads on the air. I'm a publicly financed candidate. I've not been taking corporate special interest money to fund this campaign. It's come in low dollar grassroots contributions and so we knew we wouldn't be able to get our TV ads up until the end and that we would be a campaign that was relying on a last minute push of momentum to win and that's what we're seeing on the ground right now. We're going to pull it off. We've seen a little bit of a change in the in the dynamic of the race just over the last week. Um, Doug Gansler was uh, not so much critical, but maybe questioning your, your credentials, your educational credentials, your business uh, background. And then the Brown campaign leapt to your defense. It almost sounded like an endorsement. What, what's the <laughs> dynamic here? Well, I've been very careful throughout the campaign to run a very positive race because that's what voters expect us to do. These campaigns should be about the issues and the problems facing us and our innovative solutions to these challenges. I consider both of uh, the other candidates in this race to be friends and colleagues. I don't want to win by encouraging anyone else to think ill of either of them. And I presume that uh, some of the kind words from the lieutenant governor come from uh, a return favor, if you will, of having run a positive race myself. And I think that some of the negative um, attacks from other campaigns are just a sign of the progress that we're making. The attorney general was, was questioning your work as a lobbyist, which most people aren't familiar with. I'm not familiar with the details. What, what sort of work was that? This was your own firm. Yes, I worked on Capitol Hill for a decade before being elected in office myself. I was Senator John Kerry's domestic policy director in his U.S. Senate office before, during, and after his presidential run. I couldn't keep doing that job and be a legislator. It's kind of hard to find work with, that allows you to be gone 90 days a year in the legislative session. So I started my own healthcare policy consulting firm, grew it into a business of as many as nine employees, working on a range of issues for nonprofit, mostly healthcare clients, ranging from community health centers and visiting nurses to aging organizations and health IT companies, doing regulatory and legislative impact analysis on federal health care policy reform. Is that still there or have you wound it down? I, and if so, why would you wind it down? Because it was doing pretty well, I think. Uh, it was doing very well. I was a very successful business owner, but um, that wasn't my passion. That was just my paycheck. My passion is community and public service. And as it became clear that I was planning to get in the governor's race, I wasn't going to be able to run that business and run for governor. And so I made a choice between the two and wound the business down. Uh, my spouse is currently the only employee still working with two of our remaining clients. So looking at, uh, at this race, the 10 days left, the 11 days left, what, what would you say is the biggest issue difference between you and, and your opponents? I'm running not because I want to be governor, want the title. I'm running because I want to do the job. And I'm ready to get in there and give families in Maryland a middle class champion. Someone who will end status quo politics that are focused on the wealthiest and special interests in Annapolis and instead focus on middle class families. Tackling that, that uh, income inequality gap is a cause of a lifetime for me. My father was a United Auto Worker for 32 years. We spent time on strike, struggling on $45 a week strike 
strike pay when I was a little girl. I understand what it means to tackle that income inequality gap. That's why I'm proposing not just a minimum wage increase, but a living wage. And by making our tax code more fair, asking millionaires and corporations to pay their fair share, we can provide 90% of Maryland families important tax relief and all of our small businesses the relief that would be necessary to ask them to pay those higher wages. Let's work through that. The state legislature, which you're a part of, just increased the minimum wage for Maryland. You're talking about a living wage. Yeah. What's, what's the difference? Well, the minimum wage increase that was passed this year is a step in the right direction, but the next governor is going to be running for re-election before it gets to 10, 10 an hour in 2018. She's not going to stand for that, Jeff. So it's a long phase in. We're, we're, it's a very long phase in, and it also uh, doesn't deal with other critical issues like indexing for inflation so that the cost of living doesn't eat that wage away. And what about all of the women and people of color in our state who are working as tipped wage workers, making $3.63 an hour right now? We have to tie their wages to at least 70% of the new threshold that we would set. And I believe that we need to get on a path of a living wage, not just a minimum wage, because no one should be working 40 hours a week and still living in poverty. So if you're elected, you're sworn in next January, the 2015 legislature could consider something. It could take effect roughly a year from now, next uh, fall of 15 maybe. What then should be the minimum wage? The end of next year, what should it be? Well, we are on a glide path to get to 1670 an hour by 2022. Um, it would be like in the $11 uh, uh, range midway through that point and work its way up. So it's a long phase in as well, but to a, but to a higher goal. <laughs> to a higher goal and would phase in much more quickly, Okay, yes. you mentioned tax policy. What, what would you change? Well, we, we allowed in this last uh, couple of years an expiration of the millionaire's tax in Maryland, meanwhile raising taxes on middle class families across the state. I want to bring that, that tax uh, fairness and progressive tax rate back. When we do, it generates about $112 million of new revenue that I would uh, push out in a middle class tax cut. No one's going to get rich off of it, but uh, you know, a couple hundred extra dollars in the hands of the average family, it goes a long way towards uh, pumping money and stimulus back into the economy, going out for more meals, buying shoes for children, school supplies. That's how we grow the economy from the middle out. What we heard from uh, legislative leaders, both Democrats, a uh, Democratic governor who, who signed the estate tax cut mm -hmm. this year, was that we're forcing wealthy people out of Maryland. Do you, do you share that concern? I think that's conservative propaganda. We have in Maryland the number one per capita state for millionaires in the nation. And this a state tax was an election year giveaway to the heirs of millionaires. It goes to the top 3% of the wealthiest families in our state, and it'll cost $432 million over just the first five years of its implementation. Where does that come from, Jeff? It's going to eat out of our infrastructure budget for schools, hospitals, roads, bridges, and therefore increasing the middle class tax burden once again. That's why we have to send someone to Annapolis who will stand up to those special interests and make sure that it's the average family that we're fighting for. I heard you say in, in the debate that it was time that we get serious about agricultural runoff as mm -hmm. a source of Chesapeake Bay pollution. What, what would you change there? We have to do a variety of things. One, bridge the divide between environmentalists and the agricultural community that's, that's been too long. I am from a farming family. My grandparents were farmers four generations before them. My spouse Deborah and I have the privilege of owning and operating a 34-acre farm on Maryland's eastern shore. And being able to sit down with the agricultural community and talk about our increased investments in cover crops that could also um, be a, uh, an opportunity for helping to address some of our alternative energy approaches. If more of those cover crops were things like uh, switchgrass, which is an alternative energy, or from an economic boost, hemp. Agricultural hemp production in our state is another additional benefit both for the economy and for the agricultural community that would come from legalizing, taxing, and regulating marijuana. That's maybe the, the, the signature or most notable uh, uh, platform, a piece of the platform that you're running on. And, and it's really an interesting divide. If you look at the Republicans, they're arguing about whether we ought to legalize marijuana for medical use, as, mm -hmm. as the state has begun to do. On the Democratic side, both of your opponents are 
seem happy with the decision to slightly somewhat decriminalize it mm -hmm. for, for small amounts. You want to go further. Yeah. Why is that? I was very pleased that um, the other candidates in the race, when I reached out to them, joined me in supporting decriminalization efforts this legislative session. There's no reason why people should be arrested and be sent to jail and for us to continue to waste $280 million a year on our detention, incarceration, and court costs associated with just marijuana possessions. But it's also important for us to take it to the next step and bring this underground economy to the light of day understanding that when it's a state regulated retail shop that will make sure that it's only adults that are purchasing who intend to use in the privacy of their own home a substance that is arguably less harmful than alcohol or tobacco why are we treating it any differently and we generate as much as 160 million dollars of additional revenue that I dedicate towards addressing early childhood education needs the only way we're going to eliminate that achievement gap in our schools is with a truly universal pre-K program that brings with it new spending to make it a reality. You said that, that marijuana is less harmful than alcohol perhaps, but you didn't say it's harmless. Mm -hmm. how, how do you address the concerns about people driving while they're high and, and it's, there's no breathalyzer mm -hmm. for, for, for marijuana, there's no number that, that comes up. And also the question about the message that we would send to young people about mm -hmm. drug use in general. Well, let's be very clear. Our message to young people is this is a dangerous substance for a developing mind. And we dedicate $4 million a year in an educational campaign that's never existed before to help educate children of this so that we attack not just access, but demand as well. But no drug dealer is carding for an ID right now. The National Institute of Medicine did a groundbreaking report that said it was marijuana's illegal status that actually made it the gateway drug for young people because when they're going to drug dealers to get marijuana they're also being then given other other harsher products there is no category of death by marijuana from the CDC there is for alcohol and tobacco now we're also not encouraging people to drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes but we're giving in our communities adults those decisions that opportunity to make that choice we need to break down the stigma uh, related to this this plant which also is a medicine for a lot of people too all right, we have to leave it there. Delegate Heather Mazier, Democratic candidate for governor, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Jeff. We appreciate it. And as a reminder, we have the most recent interviews with each of the candidates for governor posted on our website at mpt.org. We'll be right back.